before, and this is the big head honcho. This is the big kingpin. This is the top. Get some lights, please. This is the big area of the whole issue, and it is in the area of power. We talked about money. We talked about sex, and people are like, thank God he's done with that. Okay, and now, <laughs> now we're, now we're on to the, the uh, power thing, and you know it's really interesting as you examine the reason why people want money is so they can choose to do things. Money gives you what? Power. Right? Sex often is used to get power. And so we've come to the trinity of God, money, sex, and power, and, the, and the, the, the Godhead of this whole thing is power. This is the end all get all, isn't it? You think about it. You see what's going around uh, from, from playgrounds to minivan fights, who gets to sit in which seat? I don't know if anyone can relate. What video is that? Is it Thomas the Train, or is it something a little more adult? Okay, so all these fights are over what? The power grabs, and you got Putin who's playing with toys around the world, trying to take over Ukraine. We see all these situations going on in the Middle East. We see all this is a power grab. We see power grabs in Congress and Senate. You see power grabs. By the way, do you ever see power grabs in churches? Ah, yeah, it does happen. It happens in families, it happens in churches, it happens in playgrounds, it happens in boardrooms, it happens anywhere there's people, there's a power grab that takes place. Power is one of the biggest things that we struggle with. And by the way, it's a sign, I, I feel like I'm struggling. I might go to the handheld. Um, I might go to the handheld because I have to save my voice. Let me try this. You mind if I try this? Can we... With this. Here we go. Okay, let's just, this might be a little better for me. All right, thank you. I'm just trying to save my voice. Um, it's been tough. I lost most of it this past week. I'm trying to um, budget it well. Um, so what we talked about pretty much is this, that everything comes down to power in many ways. All of us want power. You're saying, no, that's not true. I don't want power. I don't want power at all. Well, what does power give us? Power gives us the opportunity to control environments. Power gives us the opportunity to choose what we want to do. So if you don't want to have a powerful position, you need power to make that decision. Because power gives you, gives you the ability to control. So even if you don't want power, that's power. <laughs> and what? I, I know I'm messing with you here. Okay? So if you don't want power, that's power to choose you don't want power. Think about that for a moment. Don't think about it too much, but think about it. So we have, all of us want to have power. Whether you realize it or not, we're hungry for it. We want it. We want to control our lives all the time. You, you want power? It's too hot in a room, you put the air condition on. Uh, you know, it's too cold in the room, you put the heat on. We need power. We long for power. We want power. And by the way, power is not necessarily a bad thing. How many of you ever heard a statement, absolute power corrupts? Absolutely. And that is true when there's sin involved. But really, power in itself is not bad. Power doesn't corrupt. People corrupt power. And so God gives us power. And how do we function in true power? And by the way, we're going to talk about the attitude and the right attitude we need to have towards power. And then we're going to get to some supernatural power. Just a little bit. We're going to, next, year we're going to have, next year, we're going to have a series more about that. But we're going to... Just talk about how we can begin to flow in supernatural power that's beyond ourselves. Which, by the way, does happen it's in the Bible. We'll be talking about that probably in the next week or two. And so today is the pathway to true power is the title of today's message. And how do we do that? I like what Abraham Lincoln had to say. This is what he said. Nearly all men can stand adversity. But if you want to test a man's character, give him power. That is really, really true. People don't realize that power is a test. Power is a test. When you have power, it, it really begins to test who you really are. You want to see what someone's like? Give them power, and you will see what power is like. But I wanted to talk to you about a situation. We're going we're gonna to launch in a passage of Scripture with Jesus. Then we're going to go back to the beginning, where, where power comes from, and then we're going to talk about how we can rightly uh, deal with power in the proper context. That's where we're going real briefly. So let's go ahead and open our Bibles, if we could. Um, excuse me, to Matthew 20. Matthew 20. Now Jesus was starting to gain, in the context of this passage, Jesus was 
uh, was beginning to gain popularity. In fact, he was gaining these huge crowds. They literally couldn't go in a town because if he did, the police would have to come and shut all the roads down. And that's how it was like today. He'd have to go on the outskirts of town. And all of a sudden, these no-names, these disciples, these fishermen, some tax collectors, they started to become uh, the entourage that Jesus hung out with. And think about it. He became a celebrity in some ways. He really did. I mean, he would gather thousands of people would want to see him. And so now, hey, it's a couple of years have gone by. Things are really happening well here. His popularity is going up, and, uh, and he's got his 12. And in his 12, there seems to be, they're excited. They think we're on the ground floor of a starting company, of a dot-com. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna hit the top. We're going to be billionaires in the kingdom, if you will. We're going to be strong. We're going to be powerful. And we have chosen our ticket to ride is Jesus Christ. How many realize sometimes we do that with Christianity today, don't we? I want to be happy. I want to be wealthy. I want everything to go well. So I'm going to jump on the Jesus wagon. And that's what I'm going to get. And so in some ways, that's what they wanted. And not, those things in themselves are not bad, but hang on for a moment. And while he is hanging with these disciples, um, the sons of Zebedee have a mom. Now, there's nothing, moms are great, but how many folks know moms want their kids to be the best? Uh, have you noticed that? Uh, just, just the other day, my niece, uh, I'm sorry, uh, my um, nephew, my sister-in-law, that had a baby, Colton, and a cute little, how is he, 19 weeks, something like that? Okay, 19 weeks. And we were talking yesterday at the restaurant, and we were talking, and she says, oh, yeah, uh, he's in the 95th percentile. I'm like, oh, I remember those days. Remember those days? <laughs> oh, I don't miss them. You go, you, you're sitting there, and you're sitting there at the baby thing, whatever, and all you know, the mothers are sitting there. What percentile is your child in? Mine's in the 95th percentile. What's yours? 25%. <laughs> you know, and you walk around, and there's this comparison, and who's got the best child? And then later on, of course, we get the honor roll, and we get the, my child is on the honor roll bumper sticker. And then some of you say, I, my child beats up your child that's on the honor roll. And so, you know, it goes on and on, and there's this like a spy versus spy and mad magazine type of scenario taking place because we got this competition because we want to be the best. You know, it just happens. You know what happens. I mean, there's some situations, and I've heard this, and I've heard of situations where no one in this church, of course, but I've heard situations where mothers will harass boys in high schools that are not dating their daughters. I mean, this is a situation that has happened. They literally start, like, bullying other kids on the Internet, and they had to get the police involved. Why? Because they want their kids to be the best. I want my kid to be uh, on the team. I want my kid to win the contest. Uh, I want him to get on the special whatever it is. And so no different back in those days. And I, I think, I really do believe that uh, the sons of Zebedee's was Italian. I think the mother was Italian. Um, I really do, you know. And, and fun, people even say that Jesus was Italian. I don't know if you ever realized that because on, on account of three things. Number one, his mother thought he was God. He worked in the family business. And he lived at home until he was 30. And so, and, and, so, so you have moms... You have moms that want their kids to do well, and here we go. Here's Jesus. His popularity is going up, and, and now is the opportunity. The disciples, the other guys are around. They're, they're, whatever they're doing, they're, they're watering their camels, and here's Jesus by himself. Come on, guys. Come on. Son of Zeb Zebedee, let's go. And mom takes him with him, and here we go to our passage of Scripture, starting at verse 18 of Matthew chapter 20. Now, verse 17 first. Now, Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we're going to go to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Well, what a, thank you, Jesus. That's what we just wanted to hear. Watch this. This is amazing. Verse 19, and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify, and the third day he will rise again. That's next verse. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her two sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. They I obviously did not hear. How many of you noticed that? Go do your homework. Okay, mom, let's go. Said, I mean, you don't, isn't it an amazing way how we have selective here? He's just telling them right now, I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be handed over to those horrible people we call Gentiles you're supposed to be separated from. He tells them this, and then apparently they don't hear it. Look what happens here next. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, that's James and John, 
came to him with her sons, kneeling down. She, she kneels down before his feet, which is an act of submission and saying, you're the great teacher, real humble, and she comes before them. And Jesus says something, which I'm sure they're really getting their hardest pocket pounding. This, what happens next? Bow down. And, uh, and he said to her, what do you wish? Imagine, I want to take a Latin moment. You get this, you get, get Jesus. He says, what do you wish? Oh, gosh, this is great. We could ask him. It'd be great now. God, I want this. I mean, he's saying, what do you wish? Can you imagine the, the uh, you just see him rising people from the dead and walking. This is fantastic. What do you wish? And this is what he says. She says to him, grant that these two sons of mine. I wonder, did the mother put them up to this? Or do they put their mother up to this? I have a funny, sneaky suspicion. They're probably, hey, James and John, these other ten, you're better than they are. You're in the 95th percentile in my eye. you got a bigger head than the rest of those guys do. <laughs> so, and so what do you wish? She says, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right and the other on your left, in your kingdom. My friends, we don't know what that means. It doesn't mean to sit on his hands. No. They mean to sit on your right and sit on your left or the dictation of power. It's the upper echelon. It is the number one and number two. Now, I'm sure James and John are getting ticked off. Well, which one's going to be number one? Which is going to be the left? The right hand's the way you want to be. The left hand, well, it's still pretty good. If you can't get the right, you get the left. So I don't know if they're arguing about that next, but that's a pretty amazing thing that they ask. And the disciples are sitting there wearing their camels and they hear something going on. What, what is he talking about? What? What? And so let's continue to look at this narrative as we continue to read. The Bible is so honest. I absolutely love how it shows the human condition. But Jesus answered and said, you do, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with? They said to him, we're able. They have no idea. You know what happens later? They all run away. They have no idea what he's talking about. He just told them a few verses ago, I'm going to die. And they don't get it because they think and they want the power thing going on. What happens next? So he said to him, you indeed will drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and left, that is not mine to give. But that is for those whom is prepared by my Father. And so here's Jesus saying, I don't choose that. God chooses that. So he puts it in perspective. You can see right there that Jesus has submitted to the Father in heaven. And we'll get into that in a few moments. We'll just bear with me. We'll get into a few moments. Now listen to this, verse 24. And when the ten, and when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased. That's a nice way to put it. They were, in other words, in the Butchie translation, it says they were ticked off. They were ticked off. They were displeased with the two brothers, but Jesus called them to himself and said, hey, you know that the rulers of those Gentiles lorded over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be the servant or slave. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus right here has a teachable moment and basically turns up the entire um, sequence of power, the pyramid scheme has been turned upside down. Normally, we have, the, we have the pyramid at the top, we have the leader at the top, and the bottom, you have all these people that are serving the leader. All right? And so this is what normally it's like. And you, the, you get pampered, and you get driven around, you get your own Bishop Pastor Bucci's parking spot. I have an entourage that polishes my ring and shines my shoes. We, we have a special class at the church for that, if you're interested. And so, you know... <laughs> And, 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 you know, you become, a, you become a real high and mighty person. They're religious. They, they, listen, these guys were, they were in the nice flowing robes. They had the best seats in the markets. They were high upper echelon of society. And to be a, a religious leader in that day was a nice thing to do. And so what does Jesus say? He says what? He says that the Gentiles, yet it shall not be, but who is to be the greatest must first be the servant. So he's basically saying here that whole system is upside down. This is what I have found in my life. Whatever comes naturally, usually I don't do. Because the old nature 
wants to do the wrong thing. Oh, they don't respect me. Really? Who cares? They don't respect me. Is it about me or is it about God? And so we need to begin to examine the motives of our heart. He's saying if you want to be great in the kingdom, you must be a servant. So you got to go low to go high. It goes against everything. And so I, I want to help us to understand this morning what Jesus is saying. And as we look at this, I want us to help understand what the position of power really is. What does this all mean? Well, first of all, let's look what power really is. Power is not bad within itself. So here we, we've established already, the first thing we've established is that power comes through service and submission to God. If you want to be great, you must be a servant of all. Now, what is that supposed to mean? We'll get to it in a few moments. But let's go ahead and look at what power, the power grab that happened in the very beginning. What happened to mankind in the beginning? Well, first of all, let me ask you a question this morning. You don't have to answer out loud in your own mind. Who is the author of all power? God. Right? Yeah. God is the author of power. Who's the absolute power? God. No other power is absolute except for God. So really, absolute power is impossible for any created being to do. Why? Because God is the absolute power. So every single power ultimately has to be submitted to God. If it's not, it's out of alignment, and it's not true power. It's false power. It is a distortion of what God would have. Now, something else I, I wanted to help you, uh, us to remind ourselves is that everything God does in power is done in love. God is all-powerful, and God is all-loving. Everything God does, he does in love. Even when he brings correction, it's in love. Even the, the horrible stories we read in the Old Testament, of course, some of those stories, by the way, were not God's will. Man was just being man. But God would have them wipe out cities and all that. How, man, what kind of God is that? How could you do something like that? Well, there's more, been more bloodshed in the 20th century than ever before. We've done more horrific things in our warfare than they ever did in the Old Testament. But what, what, what happened? Well, let's think just for a moment. Remember World War II, if you've read about it or heard about it? There was a person by the name of Hitler in Germany. Germany was decimated after World War I. They were, they were treated terribly. They had all these uh, restrictions on them. They were poor. They were basically stripped down and bare, and they were just ashamed of their nationality. And here comes a man in the vacuum of this called Hitler who promises them prominence and promises these great things and promises them to be powerful. And also he starts delivering on his promises. Next thing you know, he becomes extraordinarily powerful, and he is the personification of evil. He was so wicked, murdered six million Jewish people, not to mention the millions around the world that had died at his hand through his military and what he did. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who is a German theologian who was also put in prison, tried to, uh, was, part, was part of the assassination planning to, to assassinate Hitler. And I would venture and say to you today, one of the greatest acts of love that we did was to kill Hitler. Go after, go after Nazi Germany. Of course, he killed himself, but we defeated Nazism. That was an act of love. Why? Because his wickedness was trumping all goodness, and we had a responsibility to knock him out. That was an act of love. If someone comes in my house and wants to bring harm in my family, an act of love protects. So we're not talking about, uh, you know, all you need is love. You know, someone talking about some kind of ridiculous mamby-pamby nonsense. Love is powerful. Love is powerful. And what God did, he's, he has, he's a God of love. He's a God of power. And if, it is not in, if it's not in love, it's not of God. Power without love is not God's power. It's another kind of power. And there's only two choices in the world. I hate to tell you this. There's just two choices. Bob Dylan got it right for about a year and a half. You got to serve somebody. It's either God or the devil. That's just it. There's just two people you can serve. So let's take a look and see what happened from the very beginning because power was something that God gave us. Um, power in the garden. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to summarize to save a little bit of time. But I'm, I'm basically talking about Genesis 2. What happened was God gave, made mankind, and he brought the animals to Adam. He brought the animals to Adam, and um, <clears throat> he brought to them and to see what Adam would call them. 
So it was very amazing. God made a creation, and God began to bring the animals and see what Adam would call him and understand in the Hebrew context of giving someone a name is a power. You're helping to determine their characteristics. So apparently, Adam was part of the created process. He was kind of in the last part of it. It's almost like the house is built. Now you're choosing what colors you want the walls. I don't know how I can relate to that. But anyhow, so, so he's sitting there. What color do you want the living room to be? What, what do you want to do with this tiger? And I just imagine poor Adam was sitting there all day long. What is that? That's a hippopotamus. What's that? That's a rhinosaurus. Uh, what's that? That's a, that's a crocodile. But by the end of the day, he was like, what's that? Bluebird. What's that? Blackbird. What's that? Redbird. So by the end of the day, he was exhausted. But God gave him the power to give characteristics to the creation. God has given delegated authority and power to mankind. That's power. But it's delegated. Now what happened? You know what happened in the garden? Well, you know what happened. But before we get to, we're going to take a little pause. We're going to jump behind. We're going to go to the back story of the Garden of Eden. Now we're going to go back in time. And now we're going to go to Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. And the contrast of the enemy, which was called Satan, gives a description who he was and what happened. Isaiah um, chapter 14. We just got done reading. If you're reading through the Bible in a year, we just got done with Isaiah. Now we're in Jeremiah. But nevertheless, this is what it says. How you've fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. And that means he's a son of light. Morning. How you have are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said, listen to this, you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north, in other words, the highest you can possibly get in north, I'm going to sit. I will send above the heights of the clouds. I listen to this. I will be like the most high. I want you to hold on and underline. I'll be like the most high. Is that necessarily a bad thing? No, we want to be like God. But his being like God was not being like God. It was being God himself. And what happened? Yet, verse 15, you should be brought down to Shiloh to the lowest depths of the pit. So here we have Satan who basically was shining God's glory and had a delegation of God's authority. And apparently it was a very, very powerful angel, an archangel, and it began to get to his head to such a degree that he wanted to become God himself. And there was a great cosmic war I, in another realm. I don't have time today to talk. What, basically what happened, a third of the angels were, were taken out of heaven. And uh, there's these fallen angels now. There's legions of them. And I don't have time right now to describe to them. You're like, what? this sounds like the Lord of the Rings. No, it's, it's, more, it's better than that. But nevertheless, it's true. And what happened was he threw them out. Now, understanding all that, what happened to Adam and Eve? Satan came and he tempted to Eve. What did he say to Eve and Adam? He said, he said, hey, did God say... You cannot eat of any tree in the garden. He never said that. He, the devil always exaggerates what you cannot do. And what does he basically say? He says, God knows that when you eat it, you will be like God. What does it say in Isaiah? Be like God. You see that? It sounds noble. You will be like God. And that's what God wants for us. God wants you happy and healthy, and God wants you to do well, and so... I'm going to be like God and control my circumstances, control my world. And, and so it sounded good. So what do they do? They ate of the fruit, and they, the forbidden fruit. And what happened? What's the first thing that happened? They were afraid. The Bible says that they ran, and they hid from God. God came walking. He says, where are you, Adam? Oh, I, I got afraid. And I, I, uh, I, I was naked. Who told you you were naked? And he takes these fig leaves and he begins to hide them. Why did that happen? Let me explain something to you about this. The presence of God was on them before. They had the presence of God. They had God's power and they were clothed with his presence. Do you see that? When they sinned, they lost God's clothing of his presence and they realized they were naked. Ever since that, you and I have been trying to cover up out of fear. Fear often drives our quest for power. Think about it. 
our fear has a quest for power. I'm not going to let my spouse have power over me because when I grew up, this happened. And this happened to my brother's wife or my brother's husband or whatever. I'm not going to let them because they might mistreat me. I'm going to make sure in this church that I'm the, and we, we do all this. Why? Because we are afraid we will not be able to control our circumstances. We are, are afraid, and as a result of that, we try to cover ourselves with the fig leaf of human power, which is pale in comparison to God. And so what they began to do is they tried to cover themselves with a fictitious power, which was demonic in its nature. They were trying to cover themselves with the creative thing instead of the creator. How many of us try to do the same thing? We try to cover ourselves with the creative things instead of the creator. It doesn't work. And they were naked and they were afraid. My friends, this fear has a lot to do with power grabs. And so that's all part of it. Fear, I have to be important. Fear. So here we have the contrast. Now, what, what happened to, we just talked about Satan who said, I'm going to make myself like the most high God. And perhaps one of the most important passages of the Scripture in the Bible, in my opinion, uh, of course, it's all important, but I think if you're going to be like Jesus, you need to think like Jesus. And Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so I send you. So I want you to be me on earth from this point forward. And so if you want to be like Jesus, you have to have his mind and his attitude and his prerequisite of his order of sequence of how he lives his life. Well, what's that order of sequence? Let's go ahead to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at it right now. A lot to cover. I'm going to have to probably jump here a little bit, but we'll go ahead and cover the main points. Chapter 2, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort in love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any affection of mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Listen to this, verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Ambition is not a bad thing. Selfless ambition is bad and conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. It doesn't mean you walk around saying, well, how are you doing? Oh, you're better than I am. I'm just, a, I'm just a worm. I'm just pond scum. You go ahead and go for it. No, he's not talking about that. But how many folks have ever tried to have an argument with somebody where someone says, you're right. I mean, some of you will wait for your spouse to say that and your kids to say that. How many people know people that never say they're wrong? And you just, I can't think of If you're saying, I've never done that, you probably have. So, you know, this whole thing is I've never made a mistake. I have not done anything wrong. And so there's this whole thing that says, think of the interests of others above yourself. In other words, don't think about yourself. What did Jesus say? He who wants to be the greatest must be a what? Servant to all. And if you're thinking about what's in it for you, it's not going to work. I heard a story just recently about these boys that were having pancakes for breakfast. And the mother was there, and, and, Johnny, and, and Johnny and Jim were sitting there, and, and the, she made these pancakes, and there was only about four or five of them. And, and she said, which one do you want to have? And one plate had more than the others. And, and, and they were fighting, and the mother says, hey, hey, Johnny and Jim, you're supposed to be like Jesus and share. And Johnny goes, let Jim be Jesus today. So, <laughs> so we, we want to do this type of stuff. So Jesus, Jesus does something amazing. What does he do here? What does the Bible say about this? Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in the loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but the interests of others. Let this mind, let this mind, how many folks know that your mind is the gateway of everything that takes place in your life. This is the front door of your life. Whatever you let in will come in your life. And so let this mind, so we have to set our mind. Our minds in many ways are like a thermostat. It literally gets the mechanics of your inward being and your spirit working. What you talk, think about. That's why the Bible says take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ because it's so important. It says let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Let me just say what that means. He's basically saying that Jesus is God. Okay, he's God. It clearly says that in that passage of Scripture. In fact, it says in Colossians that the Spirit of Christ holds the universe together and that everything was created through him and by him. But, verse 7, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God 
also has highly exalted him and given the name above every single name, which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Okay, it goes into all that. But what happened? What happened is this. Jesus was what? He was the most high. And what did he do? He turned that pyramid around. He says, I will be a servant. And what did he do? He left all his power behind and said, I will become a mere mortal. In other words, he left all his power of heaven and became flesh and blood like you and I, except for one huge difference. He didn't have the sin issue. He was perfect. He fought it, and he was perfect. He had no sin in him. That's, that's a huge difference. But otherwise, he was just like us. And everything he did was by the power of the Holy Spirit directed by God. So what does the Bible say? Had this attitude of Christ. Who did what? Who left it all to be a servant. If you and I are trying to gain power so we can be somebody, that's not the spirit of Christ. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. To dominate, to control, to manipulate through power, that is a spirit of the Antichrist. That's trying to control people for your own end. Because really, remember we said, true, true power comes from God. Every other power is delegated power. And if your power is not being exercised in love to build someone else, it's not God's power. It's someone else's power that you're utilizing. So here, clearly, the Bible talks about who Jesus is and how he did it. And uh, let's go ahead in Matthew 23. Jesus is talking to the religious system of this day. I, I'm convinced that if Jesus was going to come here today, it literally in human form again, I think he would tick off the church. I, not this church, of course. We're perfect. But the other churches across town, he, the, he would love our church. But he, these other people would be ticked off on why. Because he's going to mess with the religious zoo. He's going to mess with it. He's going to go in there and mess up the total structure. There is often a power grab in churches. Anytime you get human beings together, there's a power grab. Families have power grabs. Kids playing with toys have power grabs. It's just, it's just the way it is. What does, Jesus, what does Jesus do here? He just comes in there, and he just begins to really, I mean, he just messes, the play, messes with them. Uh, Matthew 23. This is what he said about the Pharisees. And by the way, he said, listen, uh, their teaching's good. So listen to them. When they, sit, when they sit in the seat of Moses and they teach, good stuff, do it. But don't do what they say. Because they like the best of the best. The, the clergy are the best. They live in the best. They were the best. And uh, which is verse 6 of Matthew 23. They love the best places at feast. The best seats in the synagogues. Greeting in the marketplace. Oh, Rabbi, head Rabbi, Rabbi, Father. But you, but you do not be called Rabbi. Basically saying, I know they call themselves Rabbi, but you guys, don't call yourself Rabbis. There's only one Rabbi. I'm, the, I'm it. They have this attitude that I'm the top tier. You're not the top tier. I'm the top tier. But, verse 8, but you do not be called Rabbi. For one is your teacher, the Christ, who you are, all brethren. Verse 9, do not call anyone on earth your father. For one is your father. He is in heaven. And do not be called teachers. For one is your teacher, the Christ. So he's basically saying all that religious system they got going on and bishop this and this and the other and an old great rabbi and walking around and being hot stuff and there's this entourage. If I could only get in the inner circle of the church, if I could only be that, if I could only be this and the other. Oh, and he's saying, you know, poo-poo on all that stuff. That means nothing. Don't let, call anyone that. Only God is the source. Don't look to these human institutions. And we like to make human institutions high. Why? Because we can understand it. Once we put God above the people, then it's hard because we can't control God. But you can kind of control and, and, and like people what they do to a certain degree. It says, do not call anyone that. In verse 11, but he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant. And he whoever, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow others a gathering in. This is why I'm not a big fan of all this religious nonsense. My name is Eric, and I pastor the church. I'm the pastor of the church. But my name's not Pastor Eric. My name's Eric Bucci, and my position is the pastor of this church. What's the difference? Huge difference. My identity is not my position. My identity is in Christ Jesus. 
You see, the moment I start thinking, well, I'm this, the touch not God's anointed. Yes, well, we're going to show the balance of this. Don't, before you uh, begin to say, what are you talking about? I'm going to show you the balance of this in a few moments. But what I'm talking about is the attitude of I am the religious one. I need this title. We've seen in previous churches where someone, uh, someone per particular person was, was as nice as a lamb. They got on the board and they turned into a demon. I mean, really, they went to their head. I've seen pastors that happens to. It happens to anyone. And this is why I believe that if you have power without accountability, if you're not living the light, there's a chance for darkness. That's why I think it's very important that leaders have accountability over them, that leaders have nothing in the dark, that everything that is done can be clearly seen and known. Most cults, such as Mormonism and others, they have secret rights. Christianity is wide open. You can look right into what it has to say. But what's the proper context of all this? Well, the greatest ambition begins, ends with serving. Jesus says this, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life. You see, it's not about getting to the top. It's about getting to the bottom to serve the rest. That's true power in the kingdom of heaven. It's not being a title. It's not getting someplace. It's not writhing to the top. No, it's about serving. And then if you serve, God will raise you up. I heard a story, I just read recently, just a quote from Viktor Frankl. He was in prison in one of Hitler's death camps in the midst of deplorable conditions. He was a doctor, and he tried to help Jewish prisoners. And he wrote a book later on, Man's Search for Meeting was the name of his book. That's what he said. He said that those people who kept their strength and sanity the longest in concentration camps were those who tried to help others in prisons and share what little they had. The physical and mental conditions seemed to be strengthened by their willingness to focus on something other than themselves. Why? Because when you serve other people, you're aligning yourself up with God's power, and then God's power flows through you, and you start functioning the way you're designed. And it works. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, Jesus also washes disciples' feet. Totally. I mean, you don't do that. That's totally wrong. He becomes, I mean, he's, I mean, you have to understand, in, the, in that society, if you've, been, uh, if, if you've been overseas in the third world countries, they have these servants, and these servants will do everything for you. And I remember being in Indonesia one time, and these Christian people there, and I'm gathering my bags and going to the, the, the uh, compound, and, I, and the, the, um, the servant doesn't, and I, I pick it up. I said, no, 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 give it to the servant. And he goes, why? I want to help. No, he's a servant. And he got all upset. Don't do that. That's just a servant. I'm like, my God, this person's made in the image of God, and you had this kind of hierarchy thing? You know, I, it made me kind of sick to my stomach. Then I realized I'd do the same thing. Maybe not so obvious as that. And so what Jesus says, he says he does something. The servant's supposed to wash feet, and back in those days, the feet were kind of disgusting. It was, it was a slave's task. It was it's, like, it's like going to someone's house, and I have a toilet brush and Mr. Bowl cleaner, and I say, how you doing? Good. Good to see you. Let me clean your toilet. Let me, call you, let me cut your toenails. I mean, it's just disgusting, right? Oh, gosh, don't talk about that. Well, that's how bad it was. It's like going to someone's house, cleaning their toilet, and clipping their toenails. How, and doing someone a pedicure. How would you like to do that? Well, that's how disgusting it was, and it was seen as, like, demeaning. And Jesus says, you know, I don't care about my title. My title means nothing. My title is to serve you. And as I've served you, you need to serve each other. I know some churches that have foot washing ceremonies, and they still fight. It's not about washing feet. It's about being a servant. He wants to be the greatest, shall be the servant. Now, what is the proper submission to authority? Does it mean, listen, without authority structure, there's chaos in the land. Of course you need structure. Of course you need to know who's in charge and what person does what. I mean, everything has to be in structure. But it's an attitude of the heart that's the most important. And to bring this balance into context, if you look, please look at 1 Peter. I'm going to ask you if it's time to make himself ready and also the ushers. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 2 through 8. This is, uh, listen, this, here we're going to bring context to this whole thing, all right? So we're not just saying there's going to be chaos. It's going to be pandanorium. It's just going to be no structure. No, there is structure. Listen to this. Shepherd, verse 2, uh, 1 Peter 5, verse 2 through 8. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers. Do not by compulsion, but willingly... Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not as being lords over those entrusted to you, 
But being examples to the flock, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. You see the difference there? They still have a position of authority, but their position of authority is to serve. Likewise, verse 5, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, of you, be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You may not get it now, but you'll get it later. I've been absolutely amazed as reading through the Bible in the year, which I encourage you to do. And, and Jeremiah, talk about what, a, what an assignment. All he did was preach how bad the people were. And he had no, he was thrown into a well with mud. He, he had no ministerial success in his day. Yet, he is great in the kingdom of God. You, you, you see, it's not about getting accolades. It's not about getting pats on the back. We have an audience of one we have to please. It says this, Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Be sober, vigilant, because your adversity, adversary, the devil, walks about like a lion, uh, lion seeking he would devour. It's not a mistake. Do you see that? Who, here we have the devil seeking to kill somebody, and here you have a, an area of, of leadership with the wrong pursuit of power. Do you see that? See that? He's saying there is an authority structure. God, God has put shepherds. God has put pastors. He puts people in leadership. Yes, but you're, you must make sure you do it as a servant's heart, not for your own. And this is a good test. I, I, please wait with the elements. I mean, you can hold on to it, but wait. When someone does not do what you ask them to do and does not recognize your authority, why are you agitated and upset by it? Ask yourself the question. When you get irritated, if you have a position of authority, whatever it could be, well, they don't respect my authority. Well, ask yourself the question, why does it bother me? Well, they don't, they, don't think, they don't take me seriously. Well, why does it bother you? Because I feel insecure, and my position makes me feel powerful. Okay, change your attitude. And then you can say, well, you know what? They're not showing me respect, and this is a position that God has given me, and I have a responsibility to bring order. So they're dishonoring God's authority structure. You see the difference? Big difference. One goes to the core of your security, and you begin to act fleshy. But if someone does not honor the authority that God has given me, you know what I say? Hey, God, uh, you put me over this church for now, and this is my, my I'm an under-shepherd, but basically my authority is delegated, and I'm accountable for what I do. This person's not listening to me. And I, I, at first it bothered me because I think they don't, they don't respect me as a pastor. But you know what? I don't care about me, God. I'm going to give it back to you. They're not respecting what you've placed me to do. So, God, you take care of it. And, boy, have I seen God take care of it for me. I've seen when I let go and try to stop kind of let, let the Lord deal with it. I've seen people that have come against my family. And let me tell you something. They have received judgment from God because of it. Now, I didn't ask for it. But God protects me, and God will protect you. But if you're, but if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're worried about your own reputation, He won't protect you, because it's your reputation. If it's His reputation, He'll take care of you. I don't ask curses on anyone, not like that. But basically, the Abrahamic promise found in Genesis chapter 12: I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. That's a part of the promises we have. God will take care of us. Then it's His mind. I will repay, say the Lord. So I leave it up to God to take care of, but I'm going to be faithful and make sure my attitude is right. So guys, listen, how does this affect you? It affects everything. It affects marriages. Are you submissive to each other under Christ? It's, it, it helps businesses. Are you submissive to your boss? Are you submissive to the government and paying taxes? Are you submissive to the authority that God has placed over you? And if you're irritated by it and it bothers you, then ask yourself the question, why is it bothering me? You know what? Uh, one of the red lights that go off in your dashboard, you know, if the dashboard goes off, they call them idiot lights. Usually when it goes off, it's too late. But when you're irritated, it's a good time to do a self-diagnosis. Why am I irritated? Is it because Christ is being compromised or I'm being compromised? Be honest with yourself. It's me. Oh, God has given me so many opportunities to work on that. Every single day, from their interpersonal relationships to everyone. Anytime I get irritated, I always ask myself the question, why am I irritated? And then I, 
adjust it, and then I can properly exercise the authority that God has given me. And then, when you are lined up to God's authority, He takes care of you for you. How's, how do you like that? And He will take care of you for you. I guarantee you that. If you submit to under God, then you are now His purpose and His protection. He'll protect you. If you decide to protect your own reputation and, and do all that, guess whose problem it is? Now it's yours. I don't know about you, but I want God to do it for me. God's my protector. And remember, God is the only absolute authority. God is the only absolute power. And if your power is not being exercised under his authority and in love, it's not of God. It's of the enemy. Power is dangerous unless you have humility. And if there are areas of your life that are not exposed to light, there's a great potential for darkness. What is that supposed to mean? If there's areas of your life that you have power in and there's no light on it, in other words, only you know about it, that is the potential for great darkness. Everything in our life should be accountable because we're not perfect beings. God is. I'm going to ask if we could hand it out and First of all, we talked about the greatest gift of all, Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do? Jesus stripped himself of all his power and became in a likeness of you and I. Why? That we would be forgiven. Why? We cannot forgive ourselves. And the only way you and I can be before a perfect God is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it all comes through the big F word called forgiveness. Jesus says in their Lord's Prayer, Father, he says, pray this way, forgive me like I forgive other people. I'm going to ask yourself a question this morning. How are you forgiving other people? I guarantee you every day you'll have an opportunity to exercise it. Jesus also says in this same chapter, he says, if you don't forgive others of their sins, God will not forgive you you. So this is, what it, this is what it means. If you don't forgive others, God won't forgive you. The basic crux, crux of Christianity is forgiveness. Without forgiveness of sins, there's no right before God. So where are you today with that? Is there anyone that you've not forgiven? Perhaps you haven't forgiven yourself. Let's take a moment right now. Lord, I pray, search me, know me, try me, and see if there's anything in me that's not right. God, I just pray you reveal to us right now if there's any unforgiveness that we have towards anybody else or perhaps even ourselves we choose to forgive because you forgave us in Jesus name I'm going to ask you another question this morning before we have communion uh, we're, we're at the table where Jesus is pulling up a chair you can know about Jesus you can even believe in Jesus but until you surrender to Jesus you're not his you're just a believer but you're not a follower of Jesus Christ even the devil believes the Bible says. The only way you and I can truly be saved and be believers is that we have to believe he exists and we have to say, God, forgive me of my sins and I choose to submit to your mission in my life. You're the boss, I'm not. That's the only way you really are a believer. Otherwise, you're just, uh, you think about it, you might believe about it. But until you submit, until you surrender, you're not really his. So I'm gonna give you an opportunity right now. I'm gonna pray in the quietness of your heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both non known and unknown. I right now make you Lord. You are the boss of my life. I am stepping out of the captain's chair. You are the director. You are my God, and I choose to align my life to what you say instead of what I think and feel. From this day forward, with your help, in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. All of you take, eat. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Take, all of you drink. Let's all stand, please. Let's pray for a moment. Can we do that? about you, but I believe God has great days ahead for our church. 
as long as we have a humble attitude, as long as we, as long as we jealously protect the name of Jesus Christ. I want to pray for you right now. Lord Jesus, I thank you for Cornerstone Church. I thank you for everyone's here, either listening uh, live or on a podcast or, or whatever, Lord, or here right now. We just pray right now, Father, that you'd bless this church, God, that you'd make us a great church because we are a church that is submitted to you. Father, we don't care about titles. We don't care about positions. We care about lifting you up. We thank you for the organized delegation of authority. We want to submit to that right now. We want to submit to you, God. We want to see your name lifted high. We want to see you, God, utilized in our lives. Father, I ask right now in Jesus' name that you would entrust this church and us together with true power, power to serve, power to be what you've called us to become, that we are servants in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask at this point that Esteban can lead us in a closing song. As he does that, if you have any care, prayer concerns, we believe that God answers prayers. And so we encourage you to come forward. We'll be happy to pray for you. And otherwise, we'll just have one closing song.